So, so this is a preview of a talk I'm writing. It's only a rough outline at the moment. Einstein's paper on special relativity, um, which is 1905, has no references or citations uh, saying what Einstein is working from. Uh, so it can give the impression that it springs from Einstein's imagination alone through uh, his thought experiments. So this is a friend of Einstein, it's Max Born. And he points out, uh, it, it gives you the impression that's Einstein's paper of quite a new venture, but that is, of course, as I try to explain, not true. So he's admitting Einstein was working from an earlier tradition of relativity for his paper. Right. Now, now there are several strands as to how. Einstein's relativity has been misunderstood. One, the issue of Galileo in relativity versus special relativity. Two, a mistranslation of the theory into English. Three, his wife might have been a major contributor to the theory. And this argument over Einstein's understanding of time. So we go through these issues. Now, what is shown here are the Galilean transformations versus the Lorentz transformations. And it gets presented as Galilean relativity versus special relativity by showing you that the maths is different. Uh, but that is false. As presented by a paper by K. M. Brown in the American Journal of Physics, he says uh, Galileo was the first scientist to hypothesize a universal principle of relativity, but he never proposed nor limited his principle to the so called Galilean transformation. So it's a false dichotomy of Galilean relativity versus special relativity. Uh, the real progression uh, development of relativity is not like that. The de development from Newtonian physics to Einstein's relativity has been forcefully presented by making out that it's Galilean relativity with these uh, Galilean transformations when really it's not. Galileo never talked about those sort of transformations. And so if you go and buy uh, Galileo, he's talking about the relativity principle by which Einstein then picks up a bond. This is according to Brain in the paper. The so-called Galilean transformations might be better named the Euclidean space-time transformation. So he wants to rename things since it is shown here that universal Euclidean space actually requires time to be universal, that is t prime equals t. It is not usually realized that the Euclidean transformation assumes light speed to be infinite. Pedagogical uh, thought sh sh should be given to combining the Galilean principle of relativity, the Euclidean transformation, and Newton's mechanics as ordinary relativity to distinguish it from special relativity. This uh, would have pedagogical uh, and conceptual uh, value as a model and precursor to special relativity. Finally, it suggested that the current use of relativistic, the term relativistic, is incorrect when applied exclusively to special relativity for it implies that classical mechanics is non-relativistic. So in order to overcome the problem that Galilean transformations is giving a false impression of the development of relativity uh, from Galileo, 
he's proposing a few name changes. If we go back to Einstein, we find that he was in a study group of his friends, which they called the Olympia Academy. Uh, their reading list dealt with such things as Boscovich theory. So this is more information on that he was working on earlier ideas. And these are the people that Einstein with his two friends. So in this is an example of the sort of things they studied. It's the film Person Demon. The picture here is an artistic rendition of this demon. Uh, a colleague of Maxwell Steeman, Maxwell also had a demon idea, um, with intensified acuteness. That is, able to run both at the speed of light and faster than the speed of light, conceived in last part by a French-born English applied mathematician, uh, Louis Fillon, in around 1898. So this is sort of like a thought experiment from Fillon, and it's similar to what Einstein was thinking about. And, and it gives more details here. Thought experiment read by Albert Einstein in 1902, which states he had contemplated a similar running along a side uh, beam of light thought experiment in 1895. Galileo talked relativity and between him and Einstein, there were others who dealt with the relativity issue, but most get ignored and overshadowed by Einstein. I've gone back to the original German when Einstein first talked of special relativity in his 1905 paper and found it's mistranslated into English. And I'm not unique in finding that it was mistranslated. This person, Arthur Miller, noted it was mistranslated in his book in 1981. I think what happens is there's a mass of literature on relativity and issues like this get overlooked and does not get out to wider attention. So the issues become such things as why didn't Einstein become more aware that his theory had been mistranslated into English? And I think the reason is possibly that his wife was a major contributor to the theory. She would have been more concerned about the mistranslation as it might not have been in agreement with her understanding of relativity. Whereas for Einstein, his understanding of relativity, the mistranslation did not seem to make much difference. And so I've got this lady uh, who's going to give a talk about the tragic destiny of Einstein's wife, Mileva Mavic uh, Einstein. I'm going to talk today about uh, uh, the tragic destiny of uh, Mileva Marichenstein. As uh, everybody knows, behind every great man, there's always a great woman. So I'm going to tell you about the role of Mileva Marich. And uh, mostly the plan is to examine how she uh, worked with uh, uh, Albert Einstein for nearly 20 years. And what So what I'm doing is highlighting some things from her talk should jump to the next bit. So her temperament, she was very brilliant, but a reserved person. She was not talkative, but she was persistent and determined. She would go to the end of things. She was someone who would really dig and get to the bottom of things. And she kept going towards her goal. She was someone who knew where she was going. On the contrary, Albert, as you many of you have heard, was someone very rebel and a bohemian. And he was someone who was extremely inquisitive. He, that is uh, very well known. But he was not very disciplined. He could easily change his mind. He hated the discipline of German schools. And that's the reason that we, he, too, ended up in, uh, in uh, his high school in Switzerland. And both of them entered uh, the Polytechnic Institute in Zurich in 1896. This is what became, it is known today as ETH. So jump to the next bit. So from the beginning, 
they had this shared passion for physics, music, and each other. Those two were absolutely uh, infatuated with each other, and they were absolutely in love, and they spent countless hours studying together. Jump to the next bit. The beginning of their collaboration, they started working together from the moment that they met, and they exchanged a lot of letters every time they were on school holidays during the summer when they were apart and all that. So there were lots of moments, Easter holidays, uh, uh, Christmas holidays, and uh, uh, summer holidays, where they were separated. And then they exchanged lots of letters. 43 letters from Albert to Mileva uh, were preserved and uh, reached us. And there are only 10 letters from Mileva to Albert that, have, uh, uh, that remain to date. So these letters were published in 1987, I believe, but that's the latest edition, by Ren and Schulman in 1987, and they were published. And so those, through this correspondence, we can really learn how they were working, how they interacted together. Radmila Milentievich is someone who, uh, she was a history professor at City College in New York, and she published this extensive biography of uh, Mileva, uh, Life with Albert Einstein, and it just got published in uh, 2015. It's extremely compl uh, complete story. So you, if you want all the details, you'll get them there. So Vanmila Milentievich notes that in those letters that are uh, uh, published in this paper, they are peppered with terms such as our new studies, our research, our viewpoint, our theory, our article, our work on relative motion. So in those letters written by Albert Einstein, you see that he always says, our work. So now we get to the issue that there were people who tried to block this from being more widely known. This was Albert's personal secretary from 1928 until his death. And she moved to the USA with him when he fled uh, uh, Nazi Germany in 1933. Otto Nathan was a close friend of his who also immigrated uh, to flee the Nazi regime, was an economist, and both of them became executor uh, after, uh, after Einstein's death. These two people did everything they could to hide Mileva's existence. They didn't want that to be known. They legally prevented, that's, that's uh, horrible, they legally prevented their son, Hans Albert, and his wife, Frida, to publish the letters they had found in uh, Mileva's uh, uh, apartment, the letters that were published in 1987. So they, they were blocked until their death, which occurred in 82 and 87. So then they were uh, published in the collected papers of Albert Einstein so. Nathan even pushed the, that to visit Mileva's apartment after her death to clean it up. I don't mean doing the bathroom. And, but he arrived there after Frida, uh, Hans Albert's uh, wife, and she had found the, uh, the box containing the letters exchanged by their parents. So that was good. So that was some of the highlights from Pauline's talk about Einstein's first wife. And it shows that Einstein's first wife contributed to his work and after his divorce it was no longer joint work so he was then left to interpret his it without any input from her uh, it is from his interpreting of it that he gave his version of time uh, which i'm going to point out was disagreed with by the leading philosopher science at the time and the mistranslation of Einstein's paper into English helped to distort this issue about time as well. So we go on to another about this person. He's Hon Henri Bergson. He was famous and influ influential uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, although his International fame reached court-like heights during his lifetime. He 
his influence decreased notably after the Second World War and he disagreed with Einstein about time. So this talk is going to be from uh, this Mexican-American historian of science. This is the book that I will be uh, talking about this debate, and it's a debate between Einstein and Bergson that took place in April 6, 1922. So jumping to some of the highlights. This is a transcript of a meeting between philosophers that took place at the Société Française de Philosophie on that fateful day, um, 6 of April, 1922. And I was studying Bergson, as I mentioned, and what I found in this transcript is that this man, this philosopher, was in the same room with Albert Einstein, and they were discussing the nature of time. And we actually have a record of what he said and what the other person said and what um, uh, people in the audience uh, said. So the more that I looked into this moment, the, the more that I understood that it was a huge story. And one of the reasons why it became so um, important and frequently cited in primary sources of the early 20th century was that the, the debate was listed as one of the reasons why Einstein never got the prize, uh, the Nobel Prize for the theory of, uh, of relativity. So the presenter of the prize um, uh, during his presentation speech said something, he said, it will be no secret that the famous philosopher Bergson in Paris has challenged um, the theory. And then he went on to explain that the theory of relativity pertained, that Bergson had argued that the theory of relativity pertained to epistemology, and therefore it did not merit the prize for physics, which Einstein ended up getting for the photoelectric effect and for his work on Brownian motion which were two areas that he had worked on which are incredibly important for physics, but did, that did not juggle the imagination as much as relativity and hadn't brought Einstein uh, fame as, as relativity had. So Einstein was kind of stubborn, and in the presentation speech he decided to talk anyway about, about rel relativity. Jumping to an important bit about relativity. And there were still three people the ones that I call the three Henrys, who were not convinced that Einstein's work would lead us to have to change our everyday notions of space and time. And that was um, um, uh, the, the thing that they did not want to let go. They completely accepted the theory. They completely accepted all the experimental results. Hendrik Lorentz was a Dutch physicist. He came up with the equations that Einstein used in his special relativity paper. Henri Poincaré was one of the most renowned uh, physicists in, in, in France. And there was, of course, Henri Bergson. And all of these men were in conversation uh, with, with each other. And they remained unconvinced that one needed to go take that further, further step. Uh, and this is what happened in 1922, where all these ideas just came, came to, to a head. So the difference they have about time is explained as follows. So Bergson wanted a notion of time that um, included new things emerging from in, into, into, into the world. And Einstein was content with thinking that time was what clocks measured. And therefore, any other notion of time, including a philosophical notion of time, was really not real. Uh, it was not objective, was the words that, that he used. Um, Bergson, on the contrary, wanted to go to a more basic, more human notion of time. And this is a quote from, from the way that, that he responded. He said, you know, irritated by the idea that one would measure time with clocks and that cl clocks would explain time in, in entirety, he said, you know, if we didn't have a prior notion of time, clocks would be bits of machinery with which we would amuse ourselves. They would not be employed in classifying events, and the word events here is very, is very uh, important. They would exist for their own sake and not serve us. So he also wanted to think of clocks as servants. 
And the points are that Birkin disagreed with Einstein about time. Uh, now on to the mistranslation issue. There are many mistakes in translation of Einstein's 1905 paper on relativity. Um, the usual, usual translation is by Perrett and uh, Jeffrey. And one mistranslation problem was spotted in American Journal of Physics back in 1963. The passage is, uh, it says, but it's not possible without further assumption to compare in respect of time an event A with an event B. We have so far defined only an A time and a B time. We have not defined a common time for A and B. So the latter cannot be defined at all unless we establish by definition that the time required by light to travel from A to B equals the time it requires to travel from B to A. So Einstein is defining how time is to be dealt with in his 1905 paper. And that passage there is a mistranslation. And the word that is wrong is cannot. That is false. This is the text from the uh, journal printing out and the things in, in square brackets is where the mistake is being pointed out. What is being referred to is some maths and in accordance with the definition the two plots synchronize if that maths is uh, agreed upon and we're not forced to do that at mass as the use of the word cannot was false in the translation and since we we are not being imposed to do the maths that way we can do the maths in either way if we want to Time does not have to be dealt with in the way that Einstein proposes in his 1905 paper on relativity. The false translation is imposing on us that he wants us to deal with time only that way, with the use of the word cannot. The use of the word cannot was false. It was put into the translation into English and it shouldn't have been there. But the correct translation is not imposing that constraint on us. Einstein was trying to impose upon us his false understanding of time, which is not really in the correct translated paper. And given that the paper is most likely a joint effort of Einstein and his wife, his wife might, might have pointed out that she had been, if she'd been allowed to, and, and she might have been in agreement with Bergson instead of being sidelined. So uh, it all adds up to the mistranslation of Einstein's uh, paper on relativity in 1905 uh, with the issue that his wife must have been a joint worker on the paper and her insights were ignored. The arguments between Bergson and Einstein over, over Einstein's view about time. Uh, if you go to the corrected version of, of what he's saying in the 1905 paper, it's nothing there is supporting what Einstein later says about time. It is, there is no reason for making a change from how time is normally dealt with to the way Einstein's later wanting to talk about time. So it gives us rejection of how Einstein is dealing with time. There's no need for it and we can carry on continuing with the old way of dealing with time. If uh, his wife would probably have not agreed with his view of what he wanted to say about time 
and the original version of his paper does not agree with what he's saying. Only the falsely, inter falsely translated has made it look like time should be dealt with in a different way. That's it, finished, end, thank you.